Okay, hi, um, so my, I'm Mekna. And I'm Shreya. And today we're going to be talking about a problem that we wanted to fix one step at a time. Room violence suits and the aroma of chai. These are all things that bring me back to my grandmother's house on the 16th story of the Mumbai building. Now, I love Mumbai bassoons, and I love listening to the sound that they make as they pound against the earth. But once, there was a sudden change in the sound. I heard somebody weeping. So I looked around and saw that it was somebody behind a bookcase, a little girl, whose name was Meenakshi. She was an eight-year-old, and she was the um, daughter of our family mate. Now this girl, she was looking through my books, and she, the reason she was crying, as I found out later, was because her mother immediately caught her and admonished her for doing this. But I was wondering, well, why wasn't she, why was she in such big trouble for just wanting to read my books? I mean, I remember my grandmother saying that she was actually the top of her class and loved to read. But this was deemed as inappropriate that she was going through my books. And I knew that this was because her financial incapacity stood in the way of her getting a proper education. The sound of her crying echoed in my mind as I thought about this on my long 22-hour journey flight back home. Around the same time, in a completely different part of the world, my mom and I were having dinner when she said that I should go to an enrichment class to better prepare me for my freshman year geometry. I reluctantly agreed, but the class was actually really helpful. I learned about complements, supplements, and a variety of theorems. After I took the class, though, I realized that I was extremely fortunate that I had the resources to be able to take this class. However, there are so many students in the world that don't have the financial ability to take these educational preparatory classes. So now we had two stories, two different opposite hemispheres, and one major problem, education accessibility. Our common experiences shaped the desire to make education accessible to as many people as we possibly could. And obviously, since we're not wizards, this wasn't something that we could do overnight. So, we decided to do some research on this topic. So, what exactly is education accessibility? It's when learning environments are designed with barrier-free intentions. What are some barriers? Well, in some countries, secondary education is not actually, um, it's not required. And this means that a lot of students who are our age don't even go to school because they have to support their families by working. In other countries, education is way too costly for students to go. And in other countries, students face gender discrimination, so a lot of females aren't able to go to school whereas males are. In fact, there are also a lot of countries where, that are faced by war stricken areas, and these schools are not safe for students. These are just a couple of examples of all the barriers to education accessibility. And we wanted to look at some of the barriers in our own community to help solve the problem. So when we did some research, the first result that popped out was Khan Academy. And now, to all the parents over here, why do you guys like Khan Academy? Probably because it's free and available 24-7, right at your fingertips, and very easy to use. As a student, I remember using, I, I still use Khan Academy all the time. One year ago, I remember studying the night right before my biology test when I realized I didn't understand anything about photosynthesis and the Krebs cycle. I spent the whole night just watching and watching Khan Academy videos until I got it. Has anybody else ever been in my situation? Okay, so I'm sure that many of you know Khan Academy, but do you actually know how it started? So he began tutoring his cousin in Louisiana, and eventually his popularity grew, because who doesn't like the idea of free education? And then, a friend decided to give him an idea that he should start posting his videos in the form of lectures on YouTube. And his reaction initially was, YouTube? That was for cats playing the piano, not serious mathematics. But in the end, he decided to follow this advice and decided to do this anyway. And well, the rest is history. So we looked at a different study, um, one provided by UNESCO, and looked at the worldwide status on education accessibility. As you can see in the map here, the darker areas is where this problem is more prominent. Let's take a look at the numbers. This is the amount of people, 263 million children, who are currently not in school. And about half of them are currently our age, and they don't pursue a secondary education. Now let's bring an example that's closer to home. Let's say that we take these statistics of all the citizens living in the Alameda County, and 13% of them are below the poverty line. As you can see, the number on the bottom over there. 
Now let's say that about 10% of these people are actually students or adolescents that are our age currently going to school. That still results to about 20,000 kids that are under the poverty line that don't get the same experiences and education that Megan and I get because we are able to afford more expensive prestigious classes. Now, if, we don't, if they don't get the same opportunity that Megan and I get, this causes a demotivation. And thus, their enthusiasm for education then decreases. So we decided to take a look at our community specifically, our neighborhood, our city, and the root of the problem was actually within our own high school. As high schoolers, Shreya attends immense competition, and so many of our peers go to tutors, SAT classes, essentially anything that gives them that extra boost, myself included with the geometry class I took two years ago. In fact, Shreya and I go to an SAT prep class where I see students crying because one person got a 1420 on their practice test for SAT and the other student, their friend, got a 1410. There's a 10 point increase and these students are upset because they are doing worse on a practice test that has absolutely no impact on their college admissions whatsoever. This immense competition that we have in our community creates a rift between a lot of students who can't afford these pricey classes. This unfair competition does not help them in their school growth. And what we wanted to do is find a way to fix this problem. So it's not that these prep classes are bad necessarily. In fact, they are really helpful in helping students learn the objectives of different classes and different material. We wanted to just make these educational opportunities more accessible to students who can't afford them. Now, education is directly correlated to wealth. And wealth, in return, is also directly correlated to education. In other words, money is equal to education, because to have a good education, you need a lot of money. And in turn, if you have a good education, you can make a lot more money. As Malcolm Gladwell said in his book Outliers, the disparities in the achievement gap between the low and high economic classes were far too great. Now the correlation of wealth to scoring higher, but that the more elite were able to afford the more prestigious classes that the lower classes were unable to afford. And since we were part of the problem, Megan and I, given that we could afford to go to these classes and that our parents could send us to these, we knew that we were part of the problem. So we wanted to find a solution. And thus, GPA was born. And now you guys just heard me say GPA. I bet what you guys are thinking is grade point average. What does that have to do with anything? But actually, what we named it was GPA because we wanted to pique the interest of as many parents as possible. So GPA actually serves as a mission statement for our program, Guidance, Practice, Acceleration. Shrey and I co-founded this program and we created our own math, science, and English curriculum to teach students grades six to eight. We, teach to, we taught in the Fremont Main Library our first summer and helped about 50 students our first year. Our inspiration was directly drawn from Khan Academy because just as he thought that his idea was absurd when actually it was a revolutionary idea that helped millions of children around the world we thought that our idea was just too common. But in the end, we got a lot of positive feedback because we found out that a lot of parents and students alike were still scouting around for activities like the ones and the opportunities that we provide. So how exactly did we create GP management? We followed a leadership model of sorts. First, identifying the problem that we wanted to solve, education accessibility, and then just creating a whole bunch of goals. Now, we use the acronym SMART to help um, formulate our goals. S stands for specific. We specifically targeted the grades that we wanted to address and the subjects that we wanted to teach. M, measurable. We needed some way to make sure that our goals were actually working for us. And in order to do this, we decided to measure our success rate by location. We first started at Fremont Main Library and then branched out to see how effective our program actually was. In addition, we had surveys for students to fill out and parents to fill out to see how effective the program was. A stands for action plan. Shreya and I shared a Google Excel spreadsheet where we made a to-do list and just made sure to regularly update our ideas and our to-do list. R, realistic. We didn't go to Oklahoma City and decide to help students there. We decided to start at Fremont Main Library and help our community first. And by doing this, we were able to effectively help the students in our community. And finally, T, time bound. Although we did a little procrastinating here and there, a list of due dates and deadlines really helped make sure that our timeline was not broken in creating the program. So we began with just one library, as Megan said, which was our pilot program. And soon we expanded to three more libraries. And then we hired tutors to get more people involved with the community and get more people familiar with the problem of education accessibility. 
We started off by impacting the lives of 50 students, and soon after, over the next year, we impacted the lives of 100 students. And we hope to continuously branch this program out um, to approximately 10 different branches. So now, education, accessibility, and conclusion is such a large problem, and we wanted to do our part to fix it. We started in the community, and then decided to build out so that we could impact more people. We encourage all members of the audience to step forward, whether it be with GPA Enrichment or any other organization, and use these two different ideas to help your community. Just keep in mind that education is a stepping stone to success, and we wanted to make this stone more accessible to students with our program. And by doing so, we can maximize progress and innovation in the future generations one step at a time.